Zako Sadwo! Hello, listener, and welcome into the latest edition of the Michigan Soccer Central podcast. Your audio and now video dip into the world's game being played right here in the Great Lakes State. How's it going? My name is Robert Kerr, here with you once again to uh, guide us through as many perspectives of Michigan soccer as we can get. Uh, really great show this week. Couldn't be pl- more pleased to present. Uh, two really excellent guests. Uh, the first, an absolute phenom uh, from the Great Lakes State. And then the second, Detroit City FC's newest player who's absolutely hit the ground running and helped the team out in their uh, hour of need at the back. But uh, it was a busy weekend. Uh, lots of <laughs> ups and downs, but pretty good, healthy a weekend of soccer. I went out and did some commentary UWS action on Thursday night. A doubleheader. The Rebels and the Nationals hosted the first and second teams of the Jaguars out on the campus of Oakland University. That was great and saw a lopsided victory for the Rebels in the six o'clock game and then an eight o'clock, a, a great. Uh, even match, very exciting uh, bout between the Nationals and uh, the Jaguars in UWS 1. And it ended up as a 1-1 result. Uh, great display. The Jaguars goalkeeper absolutely had uh, a field day, making some absolute sprawling laid out saves. Um, in USL 2 action, uh, Kalamazoo continued their unbeaten start to the 2022 season and they knocked off uh newcomers midwest united in their usl2 debut they won 2-0 out there on the west side and this weekend's oakland county fc versus uh, ann arbor fc afc ann arbor (laughs) rather uh was postponed due to inclement weather forecasts. So that'll come back on the 28th for uh, the chance for Oakland County FC to make up for the uh, shellacking on the opening day of the season. I like a good chance for instant retribution. Uh, Looking over at USLW, uh, AFC Ann Arbor continues their uh, great start to a restart in playing after being away for Two years, uh, they've come back, uh, all systems working on the field and some absolutely uh, outrageously impressive performances, especially this weekend on the ladies' side as AFC and Ann Arbor uh, women's won 3-0 against Kalamazoo. And uh, I had my feed filled with birthday wishes, 15th birthday wishes to AFC Ann Arbor's Chloe Ricketts. So... A very young lady doing big things. Um, an M Live piece that I saw uh, says she has aspirations to be the best player in the world. So, uh, some sights set high here for ladies in the Great Lakes State. And I'm very pleased to have a uh, young female phenom on the program today. Uh, and I'm speaking about uh, Lansing native, 16 year old Amalia Villarreal. Um, we spoke uh, just yesterday about uh, her competing and having an absolute star turn in the CONCACAF Cup, which served as the World Cup qualifiers for the U-17s Women World Cup, which will be played later in the year in India. And she equaled a goal-scoring record held by any national team at any level of scoring five goals in a game. She matched that in, uh, I believe, eight goals in the tournament. So we're going to hear from her next. And then following that, we're going to get to know the new guy, Carl Umet, the uh, defender who came to Detroit City FC from uh, from Indy 11 and uh, filled in when Detroit City FC needed defenders and uh, has helped them continue their push towards the top of the Eastern Conference in the USL Championship. But first, my conversation 
with uh, U17 Lansing native Michigan Jaguar uh, Malia Villarreal here on the Michigan Soccer Central podcast. Okay, listener, very excited to speak with my next guest, who's probably this show's youngest guest so far, and she just played a key role for the U-17 women's national team on their road to World Cup qualification, tying a record, no doubt, for single uh, games in a, or goals in a single game by a single player. I'm happy to welcome 16-year-old Lansing native Amalia Villarreal. Welcome to the Michigan Soccer Central podcast. Hi, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. And my first question, as I was uh, preparing for this interview with you, every article that I read, there was another activity uh, on your schedule. Do you ever get tired? Well, you know, I think at 16, I really shouldn't be getting that tired of anything at this point. But uh, no, not really. I try and stay in like best health condition as I can. So no, not really. <laughs> So, um, in the, uh, just a couple weeks ago, you, uh, secured, uh, you and your U S women's national team, U 17 side qualified for the women's world cup to be played in October in India. Um, but I wanted to ask you, um, what was that experience like? Uh, uh, it started in the end of, uh, April and into May and it was quite an experience, um, how many, uh, so, so what was that like, uh, first of all, just a, in, in general, how, what was that experience like? It was, it was amazing. Like nothing I've ever experienced before. And the start of it, we were in Fort Lauderdale for our pre, pre, uh, pre, uh, qualifying training. And we were there for about five days and we just had training every day and we did some scrimmaging. And then once we got into the DR, we played seven games. Well, three were group play and then four were knockout round and obviously semifinal and final and I think that it was just one of the best experiences I've ever had like I don't think there was a moment there that I never really was overly happy like I just never felt by myself and I always just felt like a part of the team and it was just really amazing and from what I understand that was your uh, first competitive games uh with the national team um what was that like uh, to, 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 to suit up there uh, competitively after being denied? From what I gather, you were denied uh, during COVID times. Right, yeah. See, when, I, when you put that jersey on, it's just like a surreal feeling. Like you don't really feel – like you just have the crest right there, and it's just like you just want to work as hard as you can every moment that you're on that field to represent that crest the best that you can. And there's nothing that can ever compare to that because it's just – I don't know how to describe it, but once you put it on, you just feel like you could pretty much do anything. It's like your your superhero uh, cape a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you could say. Um, so you played seven games. Uh, you won them all, including in one game you tied a national team record with five goals in a single game. Um, kind of walk us through that. Well, you know, I didn't really expect going into that game to score that many goals. I just was expecting just to play as best as I could and we can come out with the win. But as time went on, I think that the goals just kept coming and it was just really good how the entire team worked to get the ball there and get me into those good positions to score those goals. And I don't think I've ever been happier than in that game. For the listeners who haven't uh, seen you play, um, is goals usually a, a main part of your game, or w what is your game? Well, yeah, a lot of the time at home, I I do score a lot of goals, and I think that's one of like the main reasons that I'm there is because just getting the ball in the net. But I do like when I'm at home. That's what I play the ten or the nine, so attacking center mid or center forward when I'm at home or on my Dallas team, and I that's like the main goal for the center forward is just making the runs in and getting the ball in the back of the net. So that's kind of a big part of my game. Uh, you mentioned um, your team in Dallas. So you play locally here in Michigan for Michigan Jaguars. And you also mentioned a team in Texas. Um, how, how does that uh, work? How did you find your way onto the team in Texas? And how do, how do you balance that with uh, um, your activities at home? Well, a while ago, they had, like, this is a long time ago, so they asked me to guest play on their team when they were initially a different club down in Dallas, but event they eventually moved into the club where they're at now, and as during COVID, since we weren't as open as they were down there, I 
was put onto the roster so I could play more games down there, especially during COVID since we were closed here. So I played a lot of games last year with them. And this year I play a good amount, but I come down for like showcases or like two games in a weekend, but they're um, high level games. So I come down there sometimes. I went down this previous weekend for their game against FC Dallas and we won. And then I came back on Sunday and we, I played for the Jags. So it's just like, it's just like understanding that sometimes when we don't have games here and they have competitive games down there, I'll go down and play with them. Or during their showcases, I'll go and play with them. So it's just like a balance of when we don't have games, I'll go down and play down there. So you are uh, definitely in the jet set, uh, you know, shuttling around uh, w- wherever you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, got a lot of frequent flyer miles going on. <laughs> so uh, I imagine uh, you have quite a support system. Uh, were your parents um, athletes or how did, how did you become so involved at such a young age? Yeah, both of my parents were athletes. Neither of them played soccer. My dad played uh, football, baseball, and basketball. My mom played basketball. And they just really wanted me to experience every sport and see what I really see what really clicked. And I think that when they put me into soccer, they really saw that that's really what I excelled at. So we continued that, but that was along with other sports. So I would still be well-rounded enough to try other things. And as time went on, I could really just tell that this is what I really enjoyed and what brought me and what I loved. So we just kept pursuing that. And uh, here we are today. Wow. I saw that uh, in, in one an article about you that uh, you uh, got a, a belt in Taekwondo as a, a very young a five-year-old or so. Do you still pursue martial arts? No, sadly, I do not. We stopped that when I was probably about when soccer became when we when we moved into club soccer. We had to stop that since um well the drive to the Jags now is like an hour I would say, so there's not really that much time between that and coming and going. So we had to drop it. Do you think that that young age martial arts might have uh, accelerated your like your athleticism to 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 advance your, your your pursuits in other athletics? Yeah, I think it played a big part in being who I am today because it taught me a lot of discipline and just it helped me a lot with the balance because I really because it kept me like low center of gravity and I think that really helps me in the games today, especially being five one, five two, that you're going against players who are huge compared to that. And you just have to get a good center of gravity in order to not be pushed over all the time. Uh, going back to uh, recent events of the uh, experience with the national team, um, you you scored a lot of goals and your team won a lot. Like, um, what I guess as you go, can I give us a step by step? Uh, how how uh, did the team get better as the, uh, the the tournament went on? Like, how was that process going through those seven games? Well, I don't think that we could say that we got better as time went on. I think our chemistry had grown a lot because we were with each other way more than we were previously. I mean, yeah, we had a couple of camps leading up until that, but we never really had that much time together besides like seven days. So being together for that long really helped us create a good team chemistry that really transferred onto the field well. And obviously that helped us win the final because we all just stayed connected and understood how each other played and we played into that really well. What is the is there a, a noticeable uh, difference in style and what you're asked to do when you're playing here in Michigan when you're playing for the team in Texas and then with the national team? Well, yeah, I think that all over across the country there are different styles of play that are more prominent. So here more we we in Dallas they move the ball a lot more. I consider it more pretty soccer compared to like here where it's a lot more physical. And especially playing in the 4 3 team, it's really physical against older girls. But on the national team, it's a really good combination of both to where the other, we don't always know what to expect against the other countries. Obviously, we can see how they played in previous film, but it's really totally different from when you step onto the field and really get that first touch going. So I would say that it's a different level of competition being there, obviously, because you're with some of the best in the country and playing against other people who are best in their country. I imagine that might be a challenge for the coaches, but maybe for the players as well. So if you're saying in different regions, there's different styles of play. Um, so uh, were most of your teammates on the national team, I imagine they were scattered from different parts of the country. Um, did you guys kind of adapt to one of the kind of styles or did the coach just kind of mesh you in well? How did that all work? 
Well, I think uh, when we all play under the we all play with the U.S. soccer principles, so we all play under we all play the similar style, and we all understand that that's the style we need to play with, and it helps just create one team one team identity, I could say, to where we all understand that we're playing the same type of game and they're, everybody understands each other's positions really well. So it's just creating one identity. If you were, you, you said uh, uh, at the beginning of our conversation that there was a, never a moment that you weren't enjoying when you were with the national team. Uh, can you pick out one moment that like peaks above the rest? Well, I guess I could consider game days being like my favorite days when we were down there because it just had a whole different feel. Everybody was so hyped for the game and we were just ready to take on whoever was on the other side of the field. So game days were probably on my highest highs because we really all worked together really well. And that energy when we were right before we left the locker room before going onto the field was insane and we all just were always there for each other. The Obviously, as as is with tournaments, uh, the competition got stronger and more difficult as you went. Which game pushed your team the most? Well, obviously the final had really given us a good competition, but I also think the semifinal did because it kind of showed, like, uh, previously a lot of the teams had played in low block, so that's where they dropped off more. But Canada came at us gun, like, everything. They just came running at us with high press, and it really – had us to we really had to adapt to that type of style compared to how we previously played against other teams and it taught us a lot about playing out of the black playing out of the back and um building off of their high press and kind of exploiting those areas that were left weaker so it kind of prepared us better for the final so the those are obviously usa canada and mexico are the three strongest in general and that that played out at the youth level as well um Was there one player in particular uh, that was like, wow, like, this is a real serious world-class player here? Well, I think that, like, they're – I think the whole team together really just showed, like, their high class and how their high competition was in their countries too because personally I didn't really see – like, I'm not, like, saying that their teams are bad or anything like the individual players, but I think that overall their teams had just really – had good chemistry similar to ours, and I think that really showed when they were on the field to where not – only one player shined, but their whole team just did really good. Uh, you said that the national team uh, kind of was uh, something that you've been working towards. Was this like a goal that you've had? Like, is this something you've been working towards? Or was it a little bit like, oh, my goodness, th- I can't believe they're reaching out to me? Well, yeah, I think it's every little girl's dream to want to play for the U.S. And I think that's been my goal for my entire life, just wanting to wear the red, white, and blue and just representing the country as well as we can- as well as I could. And I wasn't, I don't know if the word was surprised, but I was just really thankful to be called up and had that opportunity to show why I should be there and just being able to represent it well. What was that? Uh, I, I, I did read that uh, you had been in camps before. This was your first competitive action. And that uh, in in the camps leading up to this, there was like four rounds of, of cuts in the camps. Um, how, how, how does that work? I mean... Do they just, like, you play a day and then, you know, like, the the unfortunate players, like, they just get get called into the office? Like, how how does that work in a way to um, keep it positive yet people are being cut? Yeah, no, so not at all like that. So when you have the camps, it's seven days. So we started out – we started out with a certain amount, and certain people would be cut down every time. So you eventually – I think it started at 36, and then it was cut to 28, and then – I think it was cut down to 22, but you would play, you would have a seven day camp and then you would, you would come in, you'd practice for like three days and then there would be a scrimmage. Then you practice another three days and then there would be another scrimmage. So at the end of the camp, you, they never really like, was they never really called people into the office, you could say. And everybody just, they just tried as hard as they could during the training camp to show their abilities and how they work with the team. And after the camps, you would get an email of whether, I think, whether you would continue, if you continued going on for the next information for the next camp, or if you were not going to the next camp. It would be coming out to the, like, how they would do it is they would send out the information for, like, the next camp, like, leading up to the next camp, rather than, like, right after the, right after that camp that you had just been to giving you like, Hey, you didn't make it or anything like that. So it was like a smooth process. Nothing really like 
like it wasn't really demoralizing or anything. Yeah, I could see that. That's where the I could see tact and uh, you know having incredible like personnel management with uh if you had to cut somebody but there's someone in the future like to to make that news you know obviously no one wants to be cut it's bad news but to keep them positive because obviously you guys are very young and there's you know plenty of time in the future for um possibly being included i could see that being a a, a tricky a tricky balance there um moving forward um i'm just curious we're we're um talking here I, i'm we we all have busy things but it sounds like you have an incredible amount of things on your plate activities i mean you're still in high school you're playing for the national team as well as a couple club teams um what helps you most balance all those well i think that what helps me most balance that is my support system here at home and they really just have my back on all things and also my school because they're really understanding of the situation uh, that I'm in, especially considering that those were three long weeks where the connection might not have been great to do the schoolwork, but also them understanding that maybe I might need more time type, type things. And they're really, they're really good with that. So I think that having a good support system is really crucial to want to be to succeeding when you have a lot of things on your plate and it just really helps overall. Yeah, I could imagine. I mean, I mean, you said you travel an hour for Jaguars practice. I mean, if you didn't have that that incredible support system that you have, I mean, those opportunities might not be as uh, uh, able to uh, follow through on. Right. Yeah. See, um, especially with that hour drive, I, I myself don't drive. So it's really important for my parents to be able to get me there. And back and then just being so helpful with it. So I think that, like I said, it's just really an important part. Are you in your high school junior season? I'm or a sophomore. Year? You're a sophomore. Yes. Okay. So I was going to say, um, uh, I was going to ask, is is the college route perhaps in your future or is it too early to, to know that? So it's this June 15th coming up is the day that like the colleges can start talking to you where it's not like since NCAA rules don't allow them to talk to you up until June 15th of your like the summer going into your junior year. So this is this June 15th is like a big day because that's the day that colleges can start reaching out and they can have like direct communication with you. So college is in your uh, plans. Is there any thought to to maybe professional world yet? Oh, well, you know, see, I have college in my plans because I want to continue my education. But, you know, there's a lot of things that you don't really know yet. Like pro could be in there, but also going to college will help you later on. So I think that college is more in the plans than it is pro, especially considering like the new NIL thing compared to like how they would in previous years, like Lindsey Horan or Mallory Pugh, where they skipped college and just went right into pro. Yeah, speaking of um, current uh, senior uh, women's national team players, um, who are the players that you looked up to when you really started to get you know real serious with soccer? Well, I guess on like the previous national team who was like kind of like the golden team, I really liked Carly Lloyd and her style of play. So considering we play similar positions as well, I think that she was just a real class act, and she always came and worked hard. And I just. Really, she was a real big role model for me because she kind of showed all the things that I wanted to be and how she represented the crest was how I wanted to represent it. Yeah, there's definitely uh, no uh, doubting her commitment to things. I, I don't think I've ever seen Carly Lloyd do anything halfway um, in, 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 in a number of different roles, uh, whether in midfield or, you know, when she's asked to score in goals, uh, is that kind of how you see yourself? You're willing to get stuck in, but you definitely want to score goals on the other end, right? Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, there's nothing – like, if the if the U17 national team was like, you need to play defense, I would do it but just because, you know, you, have, you want to have the dedication to be there. And I don't think there's anything that you wouldn't do to continue playing there. And I think that she just really – like you said, she didn't really have anything. She always gave full everything. She gave everything for the game. And I think that's just how being on the U.S. team should always be. You mentioned um, June fifteenth as as a big date uh, for kind of how things might play out, but uh, the Women's World Cup is in India in October. Um, what lies between uh, now, here in mid May, and and then? 
Well, I don't really know yet. I just know that that's the next big thing. And if there maybe is a camp, then they might set it up. But as of right now, I just know that there's the World Cup, and I'm going to try and stay on that route to be on the team. Is there – did you say there's camps between now and then? I do not know that yet. They haven't said anything, so I'm. Oh, not... fair enough. So <laughs> you're you're just uh, fingers crossed. Yeah. Uh, like anyone else. Yes. Exactly. Um. And and in India, uh, that that's quite a a, a destination. That <laughs> just going a trip across the world seems exciting in its own right. Yeah i I have no I had no idea that it was going to be there. Like I knew that it was going to be somewhere different, but I've never like. I never would have thought India. And I think it's going to just be a really fun experience, not just the playing of soccer there, but also being there is just going to be something obviously that you've never, that I've never experienced. Up until now, what's the farthest uh, destination you've been with soccer? Um, the, uh, the Dominican probably that's the farthest international I've gone. And that's obviously the first international I've gone with the U S but that's the farthest I've gone ever. What is the favorite goal, like, if you think back, what's the favorite goal that you scored yourself? Like, ever or there? Uh, ever. Hmm, that is a really good question. I think maybe I've, well, I'll just consider there. So I think my favorite from there was maybe the one against um, Puerto Rico, I think it was, when they gave it to me at the top of the box and I just had that bend on it, I literally seen, I watch that every day just, and I'm always amazed by how that happens because I tried it recently in practice and the ball did not hit at all how it did when I was there. So I think that that was probably one of my favorite goals when I was there, that or the header one, because I've never scored a header goal in my life up until this point. So I think that that was probably my most, like, I don't know. I was really mind blown by that, that I even did it. So so that's pretty incredible. You've never scored a header goal in all your times, and then you do it uh, on the biggest stage so far? Yeah, I, I was really blown away by that myself. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask you another one about goal. What is the favorite goal that you've, you've watched? Hmm, that is a good question. I don't know, like watched from the tournament or just like general? In general, watching uh, on TV. Oh, okay. Um, well, I watch like a lot of soccer clips, so I would have to be like, um, I don't know. I'd probably be like some sick trick shot or something, but maybe recent events. I like Spurs. So I think that, uh, the goal, I guess I could consider like the Arsenal goal from, uh, Harry Kane. The second one, I think it was kind of like, he had kind of like a sliding header into like the side, like right in the back. And I thought that was so insane just because of how he like his dedication to get that goal was just like amazing to me this interview was going well until you said you're a spurs fan yeah yeah most people say that i don't know i just i like their style of play oh yeah that's fine but it will break my heart if the uh, I'm a Liverpool uh, fan, and it would break my heart if that draw against Spurs uh, cost us the title. <laughs> well, you guys have been doing good. I, I don't know. Liverpool's a good team. They're probably like my second favorite in the Prem. So. Yeah, there's definitely nothing to gripe about. I mean, I grew up. Uh, I'm a double plus your age, and up until the last five years, uh, it was a lot of second place finishes and stuff. So I, I'm definitely basking in the glory of how much they're winning now. So yeah. I have another another goal related question for you here though. What is your dream goal? Like when you are dreaming of what's the the, the best goal you could score um what what is your dream goal? Hmm. Well, I think my dream goal up to this point was a header goal and I think I kind of got that, but uh maybe maybe like something like Oh, probably like a back heel flick. I've always wanted to have that actually work. Like I've never, it's always hit the defender or something, but maybe like a cool back heel flick trick or like maybe on a PK to where, okay, when I take PKs, I'm really strict with how I do it every time. I take like the same amount of steps and I always am like super focused in, but maybe having more of like a creative one to where a cool run up or something. But I've always dreamed about having like a cool PK type thing but that has never worked out because i just keep it to the same thing every time i think the all-time cheekiest penalty kick has got to be the the pass yes 
the pass to like somebody else running into the box. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I watched the whole compilation. Of, okay, this is funny. I watched the whole compilation of those yesterday when I was on my way to practice. And literally nothing stuns the keeper more than when that happens. I mean, I don't think it stuns anybody. I don't think it stuns anybody any less either. Uh, I don't think I've seen it more than one time. I think there was uh, Messi and Suarez is the one that I remember. Was there more than one on that reel? Yeah, they had a couple on there, and I don't know. I was really mind blown by them actually working, and yeah, they were just really cool. I mean, that's similar to the Panenka, where uh, you know your 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 genius is if if it if it works out, but if you do and it doesn't score, <laughs> then uh, yeah. there might be an angry coach. Yeah, that's always that's always seems to be the case. Like you're either like the lifesaver or you just killed everybody's dream. So, well, Amalia Villarreal. Uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, and thank you so much for spending time with the Michigan Soccer Central podcast. Oh, yes, of course. Thank you for having me. Welcome back in uh, Michigan Soccer Central podcast here. Uh, very pleased to be bringing in the newest member of the Detroit City FC squad onto the show this week for the LaRouge Report. Veteran defender who has slotted straight into City's lineup, aiding in uh, DCFC's uh, push to the top of the Eastern Conference. Thank you so much, and I'm pleased to say hello to uh, Carl We met. Hi, how are you? Thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. So I'll start with uh, we're on the heels of your the last training before a break. How long do you guys get off after uh, what has been? Uh, a lot of games over the last uh, month and a half for uh, the squad. Yeah, I mean a lot of games. Five games in fifteen days, so we had uh, we had a lot of uh, running, a lot of uh, competing to do, but we get five days off, so it's always good. Five days off, and it's been an incredible run, and it's been remarkable that when the side needed defense the most, it was the squad was threadbare. Um, injuries and thin anyway, and you came in and uh, uh, how have you been able to slot in and help this team get these positive results? I mean, it's been, it's been easier than I thought. Uh, the team is so hardworking and welcoming. Um, that has been actually pretty decent. Uh, just coming into squad, uh, obviously played some games right away. So I uh, was kind of adjusting to the, the, the system and the, the different personalities, the, the different styles of play of everyone. So, um, but no, it's been, it's been good. We've, we've had results and uh, we've been competing for, for those five games in 15 days. So it was good for me to, to kind of gauge the atmosphere, gauge the, um, the coaches, the players, and uh, go from there. So you've uh, featured four times for City, and that's like dropped into a run of only one defeat, I think, in regulation in the last 14 or so games. Um, what? Uh, how did Trevor James, uh, what does he do that a- helps players adjust and uh, fit into the, the team so quickly? I mean, he's just so welcoming, and he's, uh, he allows you to play your style as well. You won't. Uh, he won't tell you exactly how you play, and let me let you, yourself express. Um, let you express yourself on the field. So for me, it's been it's been very good, and uh, yeah, I mean, welcome me to the team, introduce me, and um, had some kind words, and yeah, just figured it out from there. So you've been around the team for three or four weeks now. We're we're speaking on May twenty fourth, twenty two, and uh, you when did you arrive in Detroit? I arrived. So I arrived for the Red Bull game, the Friday of the Red Bull game. I don't know when that was. Maybe three weeks ago, I think. Yeah, three weeks ago. Uh, so the Red Bull game was. Um... April 30th, actually. So you've been here just about a month. Um, who was the first person you saw when you arrived? Uh, so actually, I wasn't inter- introduced to the team until the Wednesday, uh, the Monday. So I just got set up with Tiffany, our, our team admin. Um, and yeah, uh, for, for first person I saw, I think, was Chris, the equipment manager, when I came. And uh got saw the entire team at the same time almost so 
uh, it was a lot of names, a lot of names to to try and uh, remember. But actually, you know, now that I remember, I saw Stevie and uh, Matt Lewis, so the the center backs were the the two first players that I saw when I came to the, the clubhouse. Yeah, so um, you just spent the last four years for Indy 11 and had some MLS and USL years before that. Um, did you have any uh, knowledge of uh, DCFC before you came here? Yeah, yeah, I had some knowledge. I um, Well, Trevor was uh, in Indy in 2018 when I was there. Uh, he, he was GM. He was kind of helping to pick up the team. So I got to knew him uh, a little bit down there. So I knew he was in Detroit, and we played a, a preseason game against them at, at Keyword a few years, a few years back. And obviously, I played with Kevin Venegas, so I knew a little bit about the team. And on social media, I was seeing the team was doing very well, but um, I didn't know it was at that level. When I came here with the fans and um, the team is very organized, so I was I was pleased with that. So you move here from Indy 11 and uh, you jump right into the team. Um, what uh, has struck you the most about Detroit? Um, it's kind of, it's a very unique club in American soccer. And with the way over the course of 10 years, they went from an amateur side and then now they are in the second division. Um, is there any sort of different atmosphere or, or um process here than at any other of your stops i mean every club is every club is different um of course but i mean detroit for their first year in usl it has been fantastic um the facilities of course we're training at, at keywords but i mean the fans are unbelievable um i'm used to the fans in indy which are amazing as well but uh, it's just the game day atmosphere here is, is just crazy. Uh, first game at Red Bull as a supporter in the stands, I could kind of see it uh, from the fans' perspective. And the games are, are so fun to watch. And um, yeah, I mean, the clubhouse here where we, where we come, come in every morning, uh, the setup's very good, just makes it so uh, the team is always together and, and connecting. And um, yeah, I enjoy that a lot. Uh, have you been able to uh, get out and about in the city at all, or has it just been uh, to the facility and back since you've moved here? No, I've, I've been uh, a little bit in the city. Um, I didn't know what to expect, to be honest. At first, people were saying, oh, Detroit, you know, ghost town and whatever. So, But I actually enjoy it. We went to the boardwalk. The boardwalk was very nice. Uh, people are very friendly around the apartments and, um, uh, we have a little park. I have a son, so I have a little park, uh, right by our apartments and we go there. Uh, we, we've enjoyed it. We've enjoyed it. And we know that, uh, in the summer, there's a lot of events that are coming up. Um, I'm a big hockey guy as well. So, uh, I know they're putting a little rink, uh, downtown in campus marshes or something. With a big mural mm -hmm. on the floor, so we're excited about that. And um, it's a very, it's a lot more artsy than I thought. Uh, Detroit, with all the murals and the street art, and um, no, we've we've enjoyed it so far. Fantastic! That's that's great to hear. Um, with five days off after such a busy run, are you gonna take a vacation or explore around here? Actually, we're going to stay around here. Um, my wife is 37 weeks pregnant, so we got to kind of uh, yeah, kind of stay around and uh, just in case. But um, yeah, we're going to discover the museums. We're going to have a little bit more of a local vacation. Um, maybe go down to Kensington, I heard is, is nice. So uh, yeah, but we're excited. We wanted to discover the city, city anyways. So it just will allow us to have longer days uh, downtown. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, so with with uh, the kid in the future, definitely that, that keeps you closer to home. The The world kind of comes in a little bit. Uh, traveling becomes a whole new prospect um, with that. But congratulations, uh, by the way. Um, uh, moving forward, uh, shall we do a little bit of a get to know the new guy with Carl we met? 
the very uh, newest member of Detroit City FC. And you're talking about exploring the city and you have a few days to do it. So I thought that I'm going to ask you uh, what your favorite uh, food is and maybe some listeners and fans could uh, be helpful with suggestions of where to find that sort of thing. So, Carl, what's your favorite kind of food? Uh, favorite kind of food? I love Asian, like Asian foods. So everything from like pad thais and uh, udon soups and different types like that. And I love sushi. Um, yeah, that kind of food. There you have it. I'm sure there's plenty of options out there. I don't, I haven't found a, a Thai, so I'll be interested to hear about any Thai food recommendations, but you're from Quebec. How long has it been since you've, uh, lived in, uh, that area of uh, Canada? Yeah. So I left, uh, Quebec early 2015. So it's been, it's been seven years. But in Detroit, closer now, because I was in San Fran uh, for a while. When I went to New York, San Fran, Indy, and now it's just uh, only nine hours, nine hour drive. Indy was 16, so. Other than Indy, I was impressed. The, the list of cities that you've been able to play in is pretty impressive, especially like uh, on the food side, uh, I'm being out in San Francisco and New York, uh, limitless food options. Uh, I think Detroit's... Uh, Probably got some hidden gems, but it's probably uh, that's a, that's a high bar uh, in the places that you've you've been. But um, what is a French Canadian thing aspect or feature uh, from where you are from that m people from Michigan or Detroit probably don't know? Um, I don't know. Do you know about poutine? Oh, that that's that's made its way here for sure. If you go into some pubs and stuff, they'll have it. The thing is, I never found a real poutine in the United States yet. Oftentimes, they advertise it as poutine, but it's not poutine from Quebec. So, what's the good stuff then? Well, it's everything. There's three elements. You gotta have the good fries. Not the large fries. Not the tiny fries. Just the medium, normal fries gravy and after that you gotta have cheese curds not fried cheese curds just normal cheese curds you get that on perfect so that sounds you're making me hungry down yeah. here i'm in the, the the dungeon under the stairs like harry potter i'm hungry for for some food for some poutine for sure and then here's another hot spot question uh will the canadian national team win the world cup <sighs> I mean, we made the World Cup for the second time in so long. So um, I would be happy us getting out of the group stage. That would be awesome. Uh, but to be honest, they've made us dream as of now. So uh, they've done very well. They've beat some great teams. So, I mean, sky's the limit. But if they go out of group stage and maybe another round, that'd be that'd be awesome. You had experience with the Canadian national team. Um, what what can you tell us about that and then how it's progressed since then? I mean, yeah, uh, it was great to play for my country. It's always, it's always good to, to play with your fellow Canadians. Um, I mean, representing the country was great. And uh, But now, like, now that people, the Canadian national team started doing well, uh, we've attracted a lot of players that maybe could have played for another country. And the uh, likes of Alfonso Davies, Kyle Lahren, uh, Jonathan David, like so many great talents everywhere in Canada. And now um, I can only imagine what the team's going to be in, in uh, 10, 15, 20 years because of the, the kids that are watching the national team right now. Uh, so, yeah, the exposure is great. And um, I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see what, what's going to come out of it. But for now, like, it's just a pleasure to watch them. Yeah. The, uh, um, the American kind of like next generation coming up has been impressive, but it's really been the, that run of, uh, was it 12 undefeated games in qualification was pretty unreal. Yeah. No, it's been, it's been unreal. And, uh, I've, I've played, I've played two world cup qualifiers with, uh, with the national team, but we didn't we didn't have that kind of firepower uh, at that point. Now it's like so much talent, so much talent. Uh, uh, young talent, 
Um, yeah, I have 18 games for, for Canada, but um, we're 18 caps. But right now, uh, the ones that are coming up are so good. So it's it's uh, it's even even more difficult to get in the lineup, you know. Is it also exciting to see that uh, your home country has its like own domestic league now, which wasn't the case when you started out? Yeah, I mean uh, it's a must. It's a must if you want to grow some uh, home home ta- home soil talent. So uh, it's great to have the CPL, and it's only going to grow with the years. Um, Personally, uh, I want a team in uh, uh, in Quebec, the province of Quebec. And there's going to be more teams as the as the as the league grows. But um, yeah, no, it's uh, it's been only a few years, but I'm 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 looking forward to to see them down the road. Uh, p- speaking to people back in your own country, is there like palpable excitement or is it kind of uh, a, ni- a niche sort of a thing there still? For the CPL? Yeah. No, there is excitement. Um, I don't know, like it, it's still at the beginning for sure. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I think you give them a few years and, and people are going to keep, you know, supporting them even more. Looking ahead down the season of your own, the USL championship season, um, you've got a lot of experience in this league. Um, there's some guys on uh, Detroit City that, you know, this is their first experience here. Um, there's been uh, just almost like a, a an attritional run to get to this point. Um, you guys have a good break. You come back in June. Um, what do you think that you can share with some of your new teammates of things that you've seen in this longer season? Cause I know, you know, this is the longest season that the club has had. Like, what can you, and what do you think you can impart to the other guys? I mean, it's just being, being with the guys every day. And, um, I'm still, I'm still new. I'm still getting my bearings here in Detroit. So, um, I don't want to come here and just stir the pot so much, you know, but, um, I think just bringing my experience on the field, the as a center back, I talk a lot. So um, just placing people, different tactical uh, decisions when we're leading or we want to manage the game or something that that always happens uh, mid game when you're when you're talking to your your right back or your your center midfielders, just little adjustments and. Um, yeah, talking about different moments in my career, but for now it's just being with the guys and grinding it out, you know. And um, I think with a long season, we need everybody to contribute. So um, if somebody is not playing in the moment or something, just keep them engaged because, as I know, like people always have their moments. Something's gonna happen, and we have to be ready and. If those players are ready, they're going to help help the team and help themselves as well. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. One last one. What are you looking forward to, soccer or otherwise? What's the what's the thing you're looking forward to most this summer? Winning some games, just winning some games, having fun with the with the with the lads and winning the games, and um, like I said, exploring Detroit and. Uh, making the best out of my trip here. Well, uh, Carl, we met the newest member of Detroit City FC. Thank you so much for spending time with us on Michigan Soccer Central Podcast. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, listener, for uh, tuning in and listening in to the Michigan Soccer Central Podcast. Robert Kerr here to kind of add a couple notes before we go our own ways here. Um, thank you so much for listening. I couldn't thank everyone so much more the continued support and want to thank all of my guests. I mean, two incredible interviews this week, youth national teamer from our state and a big new contributor for Detroit City FC. Uh, Thank you to everyone for helping me put that together, U.S. Soccer and uh, John at DCFC and then all the other awesome guests we've had. Trying to find as many 
great soccer perspectives as possible. And uh, things are really developing for Michigan Soccer Central. Uh, in addition to some expanded projects like putting more content on YouTube, uh, the social media handles are building every single day. I think we're almost at 8K on Twitter and uh, about half a dozen thousand followers on the other um, platforms as well. So thank you to everyone for following along. Um, another note that I missed at the beginning in Michigan's other pro soccer team, the Michigan Stars are debuting their new um, Stars Soccer Plex on Wednesday at 5.30. That's May 25th, uh, 5.30 uh, up in Washington Township, the Stars Soccer Place. So uh, I'm really interested to try to see if I can find anyone that can relay um, how the debut of that facility goes. Some NISA action, the Stars uh, hosting Bay Cities. Um, and then I guess just as a note of the soccer weekend, uh, the, the the final weekend in soccer across the pond, and uh, we don't talk too much Premier League or international stuff on the program, but I mean, a huge percent of a percentage of us here do uh, look uh, across the pond and when we're watching games on TV. And as you can see behind here, uh, <laughs> I'm a lifer uh, and third generation Liverpool fan. And um, Sunday's uh, roller coaster uh, with all the games happening at the same time and how everything played out with the Liverpool game and the Manchester City game, it was the wildest possible path to the inevitable conclusion. Um, we really could have had say at the beginning of the day that both teams win and, you know, as you were, but with Liverpool going down early, like it, it really did, it was an exhaustion of just watching something on TV. Like my heart was elevated through the whole way. Almost every emotion was felt from a little bit of a panic because they concede Liverpool conceded right away. Uh, Wolverhampton started well, and then we tied it and it was one, one for a long time. And as news of Aston Villa uh, being 2-0 up for almost the whole game against Manchester City. And in Liverpool's score, and for about 10 minutes, it actually seemed like Liverpool was going to get the 20th First Division title equaling Manchester City. And something I've wanted, <laughs> you know, uh, pretty much my whole life since I can recall. Um, and when we won in 2020, it was awesome, but didn't really get to celebrate it in a traditional way. But then what was always possible and the inevitability of Manchester City, they they put that magic that Manchester or Real Madrid put on them in the Champions League. They just flipped the switch and scored three goals in uh, four or five minutes. And <laughs> it went from uh, we're, we're going to win the league to, uh, you know, as you were. Uh, all in the span. So we arrived at the same station we set out for, but definitely took uh, the scenic route through the emotions of there. So that's over for now. Uh, next weekend is going to be incredible with um, the, the the delayed but uh, exciting Oakland County FC home opener back at the high school of Royal Oak High School uh, in the new venue, a return home for Oakland County FC. And I'm very excited to uh, be doing play-by-play -play alongside Mitch Gatsky this season for Oakland County FC. And so I think I might have to watch that, uh, what's that, the hmm, the Champions League final and then head and do commentary on uh, my hometown team. So while it was a wild ride, we didn't win the ultimate thing, but soccer is an unbelievable uh, moment to be uh, involved in just in general to be a fan but here in the great lake state there's almost a, a competitive game going on every single night and uh you know hometown teams uh can get all the focus now that uh europe stuff is almost over so thanks to all the listeners thank you to all the guests once again thank you to jenny hajnaki for editing the program and uh dan who made the music a very long time ago and to the uh michigan soccer central core team Tip of the hat, and until next time, enjoy your soccer. Thanks. Michigan Soccer Central.